Hey, I'm Julie Bay Fan Balzer, and I am here with Ken Oliver. Hey, Ken, how are you? Hi, Julie. How are you today? I'm fine. Thanks. I'm good. You look like you have a lot of nice looking art behind you. Are you in your art studio? I am. I and am. You, have a, you have a home studio, I'm assuming, here. I do. I do. I used to have them separated in mm -hmm. a separate location, but uh, last year I brought it back together because it's kind of nice to be able to come in and work on something in the middle of the night. It is. It's you nice know, to be able to like work in your jammies and sort of, as, pe as people said, living at work is the new normal. And that's, you know, yeah, I think it is. Now, Ken, I know that you have a line of products and I was wondering if you would tell people a little bit about sort of what they are and how that came to be. Uh, you know, uh, one of the most exciting things that I do is um, watercolor powders. And these are called color bursts, color sparks. And they're so much fun to use. It's watercolor, but it's in a powder form. And it is so dramatic because you sprinkle a little bit on a piece of paper and then spritz it with uh, water and the color just sparks to life. It is really a lot of fun. It looks like there's nothing there. Whenever I use them, I'm always like, oh, no, I haven't put out enough. And then you spray the water and you go, whoa. Right. But you can use this for watercolor painting also if you want to dilute it in a palette. Or if you, um, you know, there's just a lot of ways to, to use this. You can mix this in other mediums. Like if you mix it in a clear gel medium, you get a translucent uh, kind of watercolory medium. You can mix it in white uh, acrylic paint. You can mix it with white gesso. It acts and behaves just like a watercolor and just like a colorant. And how did you come up with this idea? Well, you know, like, um, I didn't. Cave people did. <laughs> you know, like, since the, since the beginning of, of our recorded history, we've been making images on things. And one of the first things that that prehistoric people did was ground minerals and, and elements and berries to use as paint. You know, so like they, we didn't invent this. They invented it a long, long time ago. I just put it in a tiny little bottle that has a um, applicator tip. that's like a really fine nozzle that you can um, use to sprinkle out just a tiny little bit. So you don't have to paint big horses on the wall. You could just paint little things on your on a piece of paper. And Ken, were you a watercolorist to begin with, or is yeah. that something? Yeah, that is kind of my background is watercolor. Yes, and um, I am I am enamored by color, and so glowy color is even more like enticing to me. And uh, the idea that whenever you're painting with watercolor, the white that you have is already on the paper. And you have to kind of see something in reverse and layer color on it to get like the right shade. To me, that's like a really nice challenge. And then also to layer um, sh uh, layers of yellow underneath the color to get a really glowy effect. That's also something that's really nice to do. I, so, I have found watercolor so challenging because retaining some white on the paper is like a task you should never leave to me. It is such a hard idea to me that you would actually leave white, but I know it's so important to the final result. It is. And you know, if you if you have a certain area that needs to be white, you can mask it off with um frisket or I'm not sure, like different names. But also, like, as you uh, work more and more, you uh, kind of learn where to leave it and how to do that. It's, it's kind of, I think it's, um, it's a learned um, task. It's just a tool that's in your toolbox. I always have people, I, I teach all over the world, and I uh, always have people who are afraid. They're literally afraid of watercolor. Because they say, I can't control it. And um, in my mind, like I never ever set out to control watercolor. I set out to contain it 
I just want to try to keep it from going everywhere, you know, and, and also like when you learn the rules and most of these are simple physics rules of how water behaves and how water beats and how water spreads um, and how pigment dances on top of water. Once you kind of get those like in your toolbox, then watercolor is easy. Now, I know you mentioned that you teach all over the world and you do a lot of teaching and demoing. Um, yes. So are you, do you more enjoy teaching like project classes or do you more enjoy teaching technique classes or is it all kind of the same to you? I try to wind them together. So like if I do a course syllabus uh, for, you know, for I'm, when I'm going out to teach, I, and this is just, this is just me because I went to university that was a teaching university and um, I learned by learning how to teach. And so pedagogy is in my head. And uh, so like whenever I design a class, the objective of this class is to blah, 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 blah. And there will be techniques woven in there. But at the same time, we're going to make a Christmas card or a, you know, what a watercolor painting. Well, I think that's the art of teaching, right? Which is, I always think the really good teachers are the ones who make you think that you're making a project, but along the way, you're actually skill building, you're actually learning several techniques, you're actually like, things are getting more and more complicated. And so you sort of don't even realize that you're learning all these ancillary things along the way to the goal of making that final product. Correct. That's absolutely right. And I think that's one of the things that I'm excited about for the Artful Holiday, because again, it's like all these talented teachers teaching these classes to make these projects, but the project, well, it's fabulous. You know, your foiled cards are beautiful, but you're teaching techniques along the way that people can use for many other things. Yes, that's absolutely right. In fact, like from my uh, class and the technique that you learn in my class, I've got a whole pile of cards that I'll show you during the class or I can show them here. I don't care what, which, whichever, but a whole pile of cards that you can make just by using that same technique. Yeah. And actually, you know what you introduced, I bet you don't even know this in your class. The thing that actually blew my mind the most is when I first looked at the card that you made, right? It's this beautiful foiled image of a branch and a pine cone. There it is. It's gorgeous. And it has this fabulous gold border as well. And when I saw the pictures that you sent me, I had assumed that you had foiled that edge by maybe for like, you know, stenciling around the stencil or something. Right. So when I found out it was this like mirror gold mirror cardstock, yes. that was a new to me supply and it totally made my imagination spark. I love mirror card. Well, I was going to say, there are probably supplies that we all use that we don't realize because they're so, they we're just so used to them, right. you know, like the mirrored card or whatever, but you're going to blow somebody else's mind with them. And that's another thing that's always fun. The mirror card is so reflective that if I'm standing above trying to take a picture, like I can't because I get a reflection of my face and my camera. And there are all kinds of ways to try to filter that, but it's not it's not really easy. Yeah, but it's so beautiful. And I think like there are these projects that look fabulous in person, but don't quite read on film because you're getting that reflection. But yeah, it's glorious. It just like jumps out at you. I'm sure if somebody got that Christmas card, they would absolutely hang it, you know, right in the middle of their you know Christmas card display. Well, that's the thing. It's like this looks so elegant. It really does. It looks like you got it from a high end stationery store or had them made. Mm -hmm. And um and it's so simple and it's so much, it's really fun. And um, part of it is so easy. Like you might even want to ask, like if you have kiddos, like to help, the, you ask the kiddos to help with part of it because it's so easy to do. Yeah, I love foil. It's one of those things. I think I'm a magpie. I'm just attracted to shiny things, right? Me too. <laughs> <laughs> so, Ken, I wanted to ask you a little bit about your sort of process of developing projects. Like, for instance, the card that we're making in the Airful Holiday, did you just know from the outset that that was what it was going to look like? Or did you have to take trial and error to get there? I knew exactly what I wanted to do with the stencil whenever I saw it. That's off. Awesome. That's a gift because I never know. And I'm always just sort of mucking around <laughs> to try to find out where I'm going to end up. 
But then, like I said, I have a whole, a whole pile of cards that I'll show during the class that um, I made, like by trial and error, by trying different um, pieces and see how they work together and how they fit together, and even taking some pieces and chopping them up and um, and adding different pieces together, you know, like uh, kind of like a puzzle. So I kind of, kind of work both ways. That's good. I mean, I think there are times that I find once I've done a technique a couple thousand times, then I'm right. ready to say, okay, I know what this project is going to look like, start to finish, and I can kind of just do right. it without having to mess around. But it's always that like feeling through period of time where you're kind of trying to generate those ideas. Where mm -hmm. does your inspiration come from, Ken? You know, um, I just have to say nature. You know, like I live in um, rural Indiana and I live on a river and a big wide river, the Ohio River. It's one of the longest rivers and one of the widest rivers in the U.S. And we are we have wildlife around us um, any day. Like I could go outside and there's a bald eagle flying by or we have um, egrets um, and herons. Those are birds that are about three or four feet tall. And they might land in the yard, you know, and then they're like just standing there. And um, so like that's one thing just from nature and from um, vegetation and and um, plants. And if you follow me on Facebook or Instagram, you'll know that I always like it's embarrassing how many plants I share because I really love growing house plants. And I'm not even kidding. One plant that I got two years ago. It was a cutting that was this big and it had three leaves on it. And now it's six feet tall and the leaves are like this big. And um, so typically like I grow, I really grow things very well. So that's where I get my inspiration too. And um, not just like looking at a leaf, but sometimes looking at uh, like something very close, like almost imagining the cells or looking at the striations of the leaves or the variegation of the leaves. You know, you know, kind of like that up close kind of imagery that kind of uh, spawns my mind to thinking. I think that's so exciting. You know, I have to say, I've talked to so many people, I feel like, particularly maybe the pandemic has brought out nature as an inspiration for a lot of people because right. all we've had is our backyards and like, you know, the long outdoor walks you're going on. But definitely it is an endless source of inspiration and certainly, you know, where you live. I have a... Um, a student in my design boot camp who was saying that she um, had lived in Australia and now lives in Canada and that the two climates are obviously so incredibly different and that her artwork, the colors changed, the food right. changed because, you know, we are obviously like creatures of wherever we're kind of planted, so to speak. Right. Right. Yeah, of course. And um, now I uh, since I live on the water, I love to use colors that are um, that look like sunsets, you know, and um, whereas before I used to live in Phoenix, Arizona, mm -hmm. and everything was brown. <laughs> <laughs> so so like um, I'm much more um, open to color and inspired by color by my surroundings where I live now. Definitely. I think that happens to all of us. I mean, I definitely, I lived in New York City for a long time. Everything I made was really kind of like grungy and like, you know, I think that's where a lot of my interest in graphic stuff came from. I now live in a suburb of Boston and I live in a much greener area and I can feel how things are sort of changing and breaking down, you know, the shapes I'm interested in using, the colors. And I actually really think that it is one of the most lovely things about being an artist is it's like you get to take your life experience, like whatever it is you're experiencing and kind of show people, like literally show them like the, this is my feelings. This is my environment. This is what I'm, this is, we're experiencing it together now. Like you get to see inside my brain cause you're looking at my artwork. That's so true. And um, for me, sometimes it even goes like a little bit of a, step further because I when I start communicating a lot through imagery I stop communicating through words <laughs> I mean and um like I don't know how to describe it but like I start to think in imagery and try to communicate and express myself like more only through imagery 
than words. And um, obviously, we live in an environment where words are very important, and people might not get it if you hold up a scribble. And so, so I have to like really uh, kind of like always um, make sure that I'm using my words and not just shapes. Well, you know what? It's like one of the things I love about, for instance, like scrolling Instagram is I'll see a photo and I'll have one point of view on it and then I'll read the caption and it may change my mind. Or you go to a museum and you think you know what you're seeing and then you look at the card next to it. And again, it changes your mind. It's how the they always say like a picture is worth a thousand words. But of course, everyone brings their own like you know, personal history, baggage, cultural knowledge, all that kind of stuff to whatever they're seeing. And so the words really can change it. That's true. That's true. And um, props to you on your choice of paint color for your home. (laughs) Thank you. It's fantastic. It really, really is. And very fitting. Very fitting. I was going to say, it's. I am not a purple person. It's kind of the whole funny thing about I now have this giant purple people eater house. But I do feel like a Victorian house can definitely needs like color and can take it. And so it's funny. I actually have this kind of shocked feeling every time I walk around the corner and I see the house and I'm like, whoa, whoa. Right. Different. Yeah, it's nice. It is. I'm, I'm waiting to see like if purple starts to creep into the stuff that I make more, or if that was just a decision based on the house. Who knows? Yeah, it, it, you made a good choice. It's beautiful. I'm glad you like it, Ken. Well, I, I'm sorry, I'm, my I'm, child is barking. <laughs> It's okay. I, I was going to say the only reason my child isn't here asking to be on camera is because he's not in the house. So, <laughs> well, I'll, we'll wrap it up and I'll say, Ken, I know that people are going to really enjoy foiling with you. And if they want to find you and connect with you, where can they do that? You know, um, on Facebook at Ken Oliver Crafts, also online at KenOliverCrafts.com. Um, and I do uh, have an Instagram presence. So any of those places, I'm, I'm there. And if people wanted to buy a kit for the class, I know that you have that in your shop as well for them. Right. At KenOliverCrafts.com. And um, yeah, go ahead. That's fine. I was just gonna say, my son's favorite spray bottle, just so you know, is the Ken Oliver spray bottle. It's the one he always picks when he's in the studio. It's so easy to hold, it's the perfect size for him. He loves it, and it's adjustable. Is it? Yeah, that's the cool thing. It's like you can make little drops, like a mist, or you can adjust it and make big, wide splats of drops. Ooh, that's I didn't why even know I like that. this one because it's like adjustable and I can make big drops or little drops. And um, little drops for me, like for removing pigment, you see how like that has lots of little drops on it. Yeah, I yeah. sprinkle lots of little drops and then lift off pigment, and that gives me like a uh, like a really beautiful watercolor technique. That's why I like using spritz bottles. That's awesome. Well, I'll, now I'm going to have to show him the big drops and little drops. He'll be so excited. But don't let him know that you might not want to because it will shoot across the room and he could like shoot you from like 20 feet away. <laughs> Okay, no big drops then, only little drops. That's perfect. (laughs) Good to know. Well, thanks so much, Ken, and thanks to all of you, and I hope that you will sign up and we'll see you in our full holiday class. Bye. Thank you. Take care. Bye.